and welcome to all of you who are uh, watching us from on behalf of the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement and Water Policy Center. It gives me a great pleasure to extend a, wall, extend a warm welcome to our distinguished chair, Dr. Peter Chang Thaim Chai, speakers and participants who registered for the event. We are so glad that you could join us today at the NICE WPC International Conference on Post-Pandemic World Order Navigating the New Normal. Throughout the three days, Conference will be having uh, 30 sessions and that will be taking place at two Zoom uh, rooms simultaneously. We have around 150 experts and speakers joining us from 30 different countries who will be delivering their presentations and sharing their expertise with us. This is the 17th session of the conference. To chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Peter Chang Khan Chai here with us. Dr. Peter holds his doctorate from Harvard University, master's from Princeton's Theological Seminary, U.S. and bachelor's from King's College, London. His area of expertise are comparative philosophy, political theory, and political philosophy, comparative religion, and social sciences. He has published several books, such as Chinese Religiosity in a Post-Marxist China and a Post-Border World, Bishop Joseph Butler and Wang Yang Ming, a comparative study of their moral vision and view of conscience. Without any further ado, let me request Dr. Peter to chair the session. Thank you. Thank you, Rafia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Denise, as well, for inviting me to be part of this very interesting three days conference, I think. Uh, we are in session 17, and I already got a chance to get to know some of my uh, some of the speakers in this session today uh, Shabrana, Rina, Atula Siri, and Monod just now. So I don't think, because we are on a very tight uh, schedule, so I don't want to spend too much time in terms of introduction, those informations that you need on the speakers or in the programs. So I will just go right into, into the program proper, and we have about 15 minutes for each speaker, then hopefully at the end we will have about 30 minutes of Q&A. So today we have first speaker for us today is Dr. Rina Marwa, Associate Professor at Jesus and Mary College. And Dr. Rina's uh, title for today's presentation is Contemporary Geopolitics Optics for ASEAN. So I will give about a, maybe two minutes before the 15 minutes is up. I will just wave a little bit, just a signal, okay? Thank you. Yeah, I think we need that <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all right, Rina, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaiswal, for inviting me for this panel discussion. Uh, I'm delighted and privileged to speak uh, in this session, particularly chaired by Dr. Peter Chai, Deputy Director, University of Malaya. And wonderful to know you, uh, Dr. Peter. So I would be providing the context and overview of the prevailing situation in Southeast Asia in a very limited way, but uh, through two main, uh, you know, sort of sections. First, a brief overview and focus on contemporary geopolitics, which I think everyone is aware of in this room, uh, including, of course, China's visible aggression in recent months. And secondly, I will try to articulate possible options for ASEAN countries, both in the domain of geopolitics, which is concomitant, of course, with geoeconomics. So in the present times, China's uh, charm offensive and economic diplomacy, uh, as well as its, uh, its own proximity to authoritarian regimes, has certainly downplayed territorial dispute while focusing on economic relations with Southeast Asia, both through trade and investment, especially in BRI projects. This has uh, inevitably resulted in an expansion of political and security linkages. With a population of over 600 million people and a growing middle class, ASEAN is an important partner, of course, for China, but also for several other powers which includes uh, India, USA, EU, Japan, and Australia. But China's rise certainly is unstoppable. For Xi Jinping's China, both 2021 and 2049 are centennial goals. By 2021, as we all know, to celebrate the CPC's centenary, and this, of course, is just knocking 
on China's door. So uh, the goal is for China to build a moderately prosperous society in all respects. By 2049, the centenary of the People's Republic of China, the goal is to build a modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, and harmonious, of course. And these goals are very well enmeshed in the present postures of China. Hence, while the rest of the world, as we know, is preoccupied with its own internal problems and issues of reopening uh, the pandemic ravaged economies, China is flexing its muscles, not only in the South China Sea, uh, with even ballistic missiles uh, at all, a new security law in Hong Kong, uh, its fighter jets entering Taiwan's airspace. But of course, there is pushback uh, from the United States, from UK, from Taiwan, and there's also a digital uh, push that is uh, happening. So uh, we also find that experts in the United States have been nudging their government uh, to think about asymmetric ways uh, to challenge uh, China's so-called aura of invincibility uh, in, uh, especially around the South China Sea and in East Asia, including increased intelligence sharing with regional partners. And this is, of course, now visible with America's aircraft carriers and spy aircraft also being seen in these waters. Moreover, the expansionist position of the Chinese in the Himalayas has further brought Japan, UK, France, Australia, ASEAN, and the United States to back India. This global support for India has, of course, responses from China in terms of playing the victim card, uh, calling out uh, India as the aggressor, and others as interfering in the internal affairs of China. Hence, uh, to further elucidate on what these transformations in the global arena imply for ASEAN and the individual countries, and the way the situation is unfolding, uh, I'll, I'll go to the second part of my presentation. It is very evident that Southeast Asian countries are highly concerned about the fragility of the present world order. Many among them are also adversely affected by the pandemic, especially countries which are relying most on tourism, like Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore. It is a new normal, in fact, that China and the United States are now locked in a struggle for international primacy, and the result of this contest will shape the world order, not just for the next 10 years, but probably for generations. In one interview to the BBC just a few days ago, Kishore Mehbubani, uh, who is the author of Has China Won? Uh, he said that China and the United States must speak to one another, and he, as several other experts are, they are worried about uh, even a possibility of a small war in the South China Sea, even as the elections draw closer in the United States. And what he uh, felt was that, in fact, uh, this very risky option may be Trump's only hope for the election. Now, that was a tall statement. Uh, given the fact that China's GDP, according to the IMF, will still increase by 1%, while countries as the United States experience a decline in GDP of about 8%, Mehubani's book as China One truly holds water. Uh, further, I would just like to say a few facts about the ASEAN-China partnership before I go further. First, ASEAN has already become China's second largest trading partner in 2019, with trade valued at almost $650 billion. And all countries have huge inwards investments from China. China has several institutional arrangements with ASEAN countries. Moreover, they follow a very similar business culture. And of course, for each country, China is a neighbor, a very important neighbor that must be engaged. Secondly, China has an FTA with ASEAN. Yet uh, the RCP, the mega trade deal, is expected to be signed in November this year, minus India, because India walked out of this deal 
uh, in November last year. It's interesting to note that, in fact, ASEAN is at the center all about. It's at the center of almost 245 trade agreements negotiated or under negotiations. The third point here is that we all know about the 2016 ruling which came in favor of uh, the Philippines uh, President uh, Duterte, but he looked away. And that is after which uh, China started increasing its building uh, of uh, the islands in the reefs and shoals in the South China Sea. Fourth, China's role in influencing the polity and elections in all countries in Southeast Asia, emerging authoritarianism in Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines. Uh, we also know about the Cambodia situation and of course, the Thailand the prime minister also won office in a managed uh, election after having headed the country's military junta in P1 in 2019. Since the coronavirus began, the region has been witnessing changing alliances, reworked supply chains, a new economics, along with the resurfacing of disputes, which were hitherto considered having an inconsequential effect on the Indo-Pacific region. The importance of the theory of balance of power has been reinforced by the pandemic responses by the great powers in areas of foreign policy. Today, economic statecraft is readily employed in response to territorial disputes, while sales of defense equipment can be considered a proxy for close alliances. On these aspects, a few micro facts have emerged from surveys conducted by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in 2019 and 2020, with all their respondents being uh, eminent people uh, who sort of also including in the countries. So through these surveys, there are a few points that I would like to draw the attention of this audience to. Firstly, China continues to be the most influential power in the region, with 79% stating this in 2020 compared to 73% uh, in the previous year. So this uh, influence has increased. China's uh, economic stranglehold, as we know, has further solidified. Out of those who believe in this, there are two thirds who are also worried about uh, China's rising economic influence, and this is particularly highest in Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand. 38% of the respondents consider China as a revisionist power. Only 7% actually believe that China will maintain the status quo. And almost two-thirds, in fact, over two-thirds in Myanmar and Thailand have little or no confidence in the BRI initiatives. When ASEAN was asked to choose between China and the United States, it's interesting to note that almost 54% chose the United States as against 46% for China. Additionally, Japan, the European Union, and to a lesser extent, Australia, emerged as the preferred strategic partners of ASEAN. And uh, we, we understand, of course, how uh, Vietnam has very recently inked an FTA with the European Union. The Quad finds the greatest support in Philippines, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And as expected very well, Cambodia and Laos are completely opposed to it. Japan and the European Union are considered the most reliable partners in the future. In terms of language, ASEAN countries preferred English, and English got a rating of 95% of people, but Mandarin also scored at almost 40%, especially in Singapore and almost 50% people in Malaysia. With respect to the issue of trust, Japan has emerged as the most trusted power in 2020, 61% followed by the European Union, 39%, the United States at 30%, and China and India both at 
So Japan continues to retain its number one position from 2019 and in 2020. So therefore, to conclude with Vietnam as the chair, we know that for the first time, the present ASEAN statement reaffirmed the 1982 UNCLOS after several years, in fact, there has been a collective response. And of course, it is under the watchful gaze of the United States that China has been building on the reefs and shoals in the South China Sea. As far as the Indian Ocean is concerned, India is also beefing up security in the Andaman Sea. In the ultimate analysis, what I would like to emphasize is, if I have a minute, first, ASEAN countries cannot escape their reliance on China, but they would like to engage with a concert of countries keeping their sovereignty intact. Second, ASEAN seeks a rules-based order, but it also understands that China will not adhere to any rules. However, it will continue to engage China on a binding code of conduct. Third, there is an implicit understanding that despite bilateral differences, ASEAN as a grouping must remain resilient, united, as only then can there be an ossification of collective strength for shared peace and prosperity. And lastly, with respect to China, as we know, several BRI projects have been renegotiated. We do know that there is a pushback to some BRI projects in Malaysia too that has happened. But China's pace of growth may get impacted for some time and it's Keisha being expelled for exposing domestic serious political problems has certainly not helped. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you so much. Uh, your review really resonates with me. I mean, we, we do register all that, that you have already, you presented. It's a very delicate, uh, relationship that we have, ASEAN as a whole with China. So we certainly would like to pick this up again further this conversation during the Q&A if we have time. And I do have some questions to follow up on your presentation. It's very helpful. Thank you so much, Rena. I want to make time now for the other speakers. And I want, we'd like to invite now our second speaker, um, Sharbana Barua. Research Associate at the GNU University of India. And Shabana's uh, title for today's presentation is Infrastructure and Influence, the Case of China in Myanmar, another case study related to ASEAN. So Shabana, the floor is yours. Please unmute, uh, Shabana, we can't hear you. Sorry, yes. yes. Thank you, Dr. Chang, uh, for yes. that introduction. And thank you to NIIC for having this uh, interaction over the past three days. And uh, without wasting time, I apologize for not having a presentation also because most of my work is also due for submission next year, which I didn't want to put in writing. But I think this is going on record. So if anybody has questions or any doubts, you can reach out to me later. So the title is Infrastructure and Influence, which uh, I have sort of uh, borrowed from a paper by Jonathan Hillman uh, for CSIS that he had written in 2019, uh, which was called Influence and in Infrastructure. But why I chose to put infrastructure before influence is because what I believe is that if you are to have a sort of uh, influence that uh, China is aiming for particularly and this whole great game and so on that we keep talking about. Uh, infrastructure, I believe, is one of the sectors that uh, needs the most investment, the most attention. And that is something that China has recognized and uh, straight away dived into, not just since, uh, uh, you know, the pronouncement of the BRI in 2013, but even before that. And uh, the case of Myanmar really uh, brings that point out. And I will try and uh, briefly put my ideas uh, in two or three sections, starting with why infrastructure, 
going on to what sort of influence are we talking about and then uh, speaking a little on China in uh, Myanmar in terms of the projects that it is carrying on. Uh, so uh, back a little back in the 1980s, uh, Margaret Thatcher was speaking to an audience in London when she said that uh, you might have heard a lot lately about infrastructure, the new inward. Uh, some of you might even ask exactly what it is. You and I come by road and rail, but economists travel by infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, just a few months apart, in September 2018, 1984, uh, the Vice Minister of Communication in China had written an article published in, on 2nd September in the Beijing Review, where he spoke about the need to reach out to the Indian Ocean through Myanmar. It's a very popular article now that scholars refer to every now and then when they are talking about China uh, in Myanmar in terms of infrastructure, but at that point of time, it went pretty much unnoticed. But what we realized is at that time, in 84 itself, infrastructure was so-called an inward in the West. And that is when China was already talking about linking the Southwest of China through uh, Myanmar, particularly Yunnan and Sichuan so that they could reach out to the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, for uh, two or three reasons. Uh, the most popular that people bring up is the Malacca Dilemma, uh, because China, most of its uh, uh, you know, resources in terms of oil and gas and all of that, energy resources goes through the Malacca Strait, which China thinks at any point of time, if anybody clogs it, will uh, definitely be a problem for them. So firstly, obviously, is because to, uh, you know, overcome the Malacca dilemma. But secondly, I would also argue is to sort of create an influence that uh, they have held, especially after 1988 on the uh, Tatmadaw in Myanmar. Uh, they have linked, um, they have had bridges, construction of roadways, railways, that sort of gave them a direct as well as an indirect influence on Myanmar. I will speak about this at the latter part of my presentation. Uh, but coming to why infrastructure. So I feel that uh, not too much has been written directly on infrastructure in IR. There's a very interesting book uh, called The Tools of Empire by Daniel Hedrick, who speaks about how the uh, British Empire and colonial rulers used to invest in infrastructure, especially rail uh, lines, tel uh, tel telephone lines and communications, so that they could harness uh, the gains out of that to uh, not just trade, but also to have an influence over that host country. And that is something which is happening even today. It's not just to directly increase your trade. Definitely, that's an impact but influencing through the means of infrastructure is also what China is doing today. And it has rec it recognized that uh, infrastructure could be a tool of influence much earlier. Uh, a McKinsey, a Global Institute report also says that a country which has more linkages in terms of connectivity, in terms of trade, global flow of people, as well as data, is up to 40% more uh, progressive, it does better, and uh, then countries which are less connected. So again, infrastructure, investing in any sort of infrastructure that way has emerged as uh, uh, beneficial even for other sectors. Uh, and coming directly to uh, in investing in infrastructure of uh, types that uh, make access to people to people or goods and services is, you know, the uh, pipelines and uh, roads and airports and all of that. And the ADP, uh, a recent ADB report had stated that uh, in Asia, we were, uh, we would need about $1.7 trillion uh, if we are to overcome an infrastructure gap by 2030. And 1.7 trillion is a lot of money. And I think China, again, has, uh, because it recognized the fact that infrastructure is something, a sector that is so wanting for uh, you know, investment, it has done 
absolutely that especially after the bri was announced and in 2007 when it was put into the uh, constitution so uh, that is why infrastructure is important uh, the second part of it is uh, trying of my presentation i'm going to speak briefly and borrowing uh, quite a bit from in fact johnson hillman's paper because i found that so relevant is how is that influence actually coming about through you know obviously if you invest in linkages creating these big projects there is some sort of influence but how exactly is that happening uh, so he suggests that there are three ways one is through financing at the stage of financing the second is at the stage of designing and construction and the third is at the stage of ownership and operation uh, if we look at financing if he says that john c hillman's paper says that uh, actually allows you to extract some sort of diplomatic concession at the financing level besides you know gaining operational control and shaping the project as and when you like but when we talk about finances it's interesting to note a uh, few differences in the way china finances through their bilateral means where vis-a-vis -vis how china finances through a multilateral body for example the aiib or the adb uh the adb has certain guidelines uh, uh, which states for example that it will not have a uh, you know stake ownership of more than 25% in a project whereas the china development bank which finances does so much of this infrastructure financing has no such clause in it which means that they can own the entire they can have up to 80% stake or uh, more if they wish wish to for example in the humban tota port we saw exactly that that they had up to 80% stake uh secondly there is also a clause a guideline so to say in the adb uh, way of functioning that they would not uh, be usually the largest single investor china has no such clause and it usually is the lar largest sing single investor to push away any sort of competition that's there so uh, these are few uh, technical things it uh, through which china is actually on ground having the sort of influence that uh, it uh, that infrastructure otherwise uh, gives uh, moving on to another uh, way of how it's doing it is obviously the fact that uh, it's usually the investments are being done by the soes the state owned enterprises and in myanmar it's very much ev evident in all the major projects uh, uh, particularly the ones uh, within the bri um, discussions or even beyond are done by the soes whether it's the cnpc whether it is the citic and so on uh, so uh, the way the soes are something that uh, have a uh, the center the cpc directly has a, a big uh, you know hold over what is going on in actual in on ground uh another way and again this is something that uh, has been discussed through scholarly articles reports and projects is obviously what we all know that china actually insist on having their own people working on the ground vis-a-vis -vis, uh you know local people and this was an issue even in myanmar even when uh, they were building up the cpec uh so these are some of the ways that actually uh, influence is being done through infrastructure coming to the design and construction level uh, uh hillman paper again talks about how the design makes a difference because it uh, you know the kind of technology you're transferring to that particular country will depend on the design and then china could then uh, transfer the technology they want to and we have had the case of the uh, headquarter in african union where there were reports that the african union uh headquarter being built were filled with chips which was transferring data to shanghai at some point of time and this was a big controversy but even when we talk about myanmar this is again something uh, back in the 90s uh, there was a bridge that was being built from 91 it was completed in 92 which was across the uh, ruli muse bridge it's called which later was uh, known as the gun bridge because there were a lot of guns and ammunitions being transferred through that bridge and another bridge uh, for the tatmadaw so china actually was not just directly influencing but providing the military with lot of ammunitions and arms and hard power and which obviously then translate 
translates to the sort of influence that it desires. But uh, uh, Bertrand Lindner in one of the articles in 92 had written that what Myanmar had actually requested was simply a 20 ton bridge, but China insisted on a 50 ton bridge and it actually uh, persisted. Now there is a 50 ton bridge that's there. This actually is a sort of influence or power that uh, traditionally Dahl talks about A having a power over B and B not wanting and yet giving in. So you can see directly how that influence is being played out. Uh, and the third uh, uh, that Hillman talks about is ownership and operation, that it can uh, uh, restrict or deny competition or access to uh, when you have ownership and the way you operate it after you have built. Uh, this is mostly evident in Hambantota, but if we come to Myanmar, we also see most of it, its project, uh, uh, especially the Chokpu, it sort of had an ownership of 80%, which was then brought down to 70% in 2017. The oil and gas pipelines that are going on from Chokpu up to Yunnan, both of them have a 51% ownership. So definitely more than half of ownership is with China, which speaks of the you know, they do have that uh, uh, leverage to then uh, influence it in ways that they want to. Uh, so with this, I'll just conclude coming directly uh, to the point where China is influencing Myanmar, the case study. Uh, the, uh, I wouldn't say uh, China literally started influencing back in the 1950s through infrastructure. That happened gradually after 1988 particularly. But having said that, it did realize the need for having railways and roadways and highways much earlier than so many other countries or great powers. Uh, in the uh, 1990s particularly, China began to revive the old uh, Burma Road, for example, which had historical uh, meaning and importance. And th through revival of that Burma Road or the Lido Road, uh, the other part of it is also uh, known as the Stillwell Road in Assam uh, up to Arunachal. And so uh, while actually building or rebuilding this road, China in, uh, sort of brought out a diplomatic factor also that, see, this road is important and hence we are building it because uh, all I'm trying to say, it, it was uh, significant in a more diplomatic way also uh, rather than having practical use, usage per se. So the influence was not always direct, but also indicating certain things that infrastructure is important. Uh, similarly, there were bridges being built, uh, like I mentioned, the one in uh, Ruli and Musay, and a similar one from Wanding to Kyoyok, Kyo uh, both built in 1992, which later locally began to be known as gun bridges. Uh, by the 1990s or up to 2000s, in fact, there were engineers and, cons uh, you know, uh, civil engineers who were visiting the ports in Myanmar already. So in one of the articles, it's written that by 2000, there were inspectors already uh, in a Chokpu port, which actually was later signed in 2007. And uh, we know that the city group won the contract. So these were plannings that were going on in the early 90s, which later were implemented. And uh, besides the dams that were being built, uh, obviously the Mitsione Dam was uh, suspended. Again, it's not been canceled. So we are yet to see maybe the November elections and how things go. Uh, the influence matters when infrastructure is doing well. Uh, definitely, it shows that there's more influence that China has. Whereas if a port or a project or a dam project is cancelled, you show, you indicate that, okay, China is probably having less influence in that sense because they have started to take their own decisions. Uh, Myanmar has introduced a project bank very lately. Uh, they are now, uh, they have put in place a project bank, which actually does a proper, they had issues like uh, Dr. Marwa said that they do not really trust the BRI to do well. So they did have a project bank in Myanmar where they decide what kind of projects they want to uh, other countries to invest in. Uh, similarly, Japan is coming in a big way in Myanmar as well. India is trying its luck to uh, trying to uh, get the Kaladan project completed and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, just coming to the conclusion that there is one big project, the uh, the CMEC, which was again, uh, we were very confused at whether it's a part of the 
uh, BRI or not. So uh, these confusions are emerging as and when you realize that they want less influence of China, even in political matters, there is either a cancellation or a suspension of projects or things like that. And when uh, China is politically also doing well, these projects suddenly come in. This year in 2020, January, we had Xi Jinping visit the country after almost 19 years of done by president after 19 years and 33 MOUs of, were signed out of which 13 were to do with infrastructure which obviously uh, uh, sort of shows that infrastructure is one of the biggest tools of influence today. Uh, and uh, in terms of projects also, the amount of money that's going in is so big that, uh, yes, I'm just concluding, uh, just the same point, repeating, repeating the same point that how infrastructure is today a tool of influence and exactly through influence, infrastructure is being uh, invested in, and it's the same way infrastructure investment equal to more influence. With this, I would end my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shabrana. You know, a lot of what you say, uh, we experience it in Malaysia as well. I'm not too sure if you follow. It's interesting that you, you mentioned the Straits of Malacca. I'm actually from Malacca, and in the Straits of Malacca, my town Malacca itself is a, the most narrow bit of the strait, and it's become of very strategic importance. And there are a lot of investment by China in my hometown also. And that has also drawn a lot of geopolitical interest from the West and China and others in terms of both commercial infrastructure and also geopolitic and strategic uh, importance. Um, let's continue this conversation uh, during the Q&A. Uh, let's move on to our third speaker uh, in, the, in the interest of time so that we could um, finish off in, in, within the time that is allocated. And we have Dr. Atulasiri Kumara Samarakun, a senior lecturer in politics and IRR at the Open University of Sri Lanka. Atulasiri's title for today's presentation is Impossibility or Possibility of Neutrality or Lack of Commitment, Understanding Sri Lanka Foreign Policy Towards Major Powers in Post-War Period. Okay, the floor is yours, Abdul Asari. Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, please. Uh, yeah. Thank yes. you, uh, Dr. Chang. And I need to share my presentation with you. So I will share my screen now, right? Okay, go ahead. Right, is that okay? Right. So I think my title is very clear. Uh, impossibility or possibility of neutrality or lack of commitment understanding Sri Lanka's foreign policy towards major powers uh, during the post-war period, that is after 2009. You know, you all know that Sri Lanka had a bitter, bitter ethnic war and uh, it ended uh, violently in 2009. So that is the uh, starting point for this uh, uh, research. Uh, uh, this is the content of my discussion. Uh, traditional major powers will have a look at briefly uh, who the traditional major powers that Sri Lanka uh, associated uh, historically and then uh, go to understand the post-war realignments of uh, power relations. And I'm asking a question whether Sri Lanka deviated from neutrality or not. And uh, there's another theme, gambling for survival under anarchy and uh, possibility or impossibility of neutrality and neutrality as a political ethical problem. So these are the content in my discussion. So some of the traditional major powers, all the researchers I think uh, have focused uh, in their foreign policy studies when it comes to Sri Lankan studies, uh, India, UK, US, Russia, previously called USSR and People's Republic of China. So they are the traditional major powers that Sri Lanka mainly focused when it comes to its foreign policy. And however, uh, the nature uh, and the extent and the depth of the relations with the uh, powers depended much on the ruling regimes and their uh, declared policies, but most crucially on the incentives or dissent, disincentives for, from the polarity. I mean the bipolarity or unipolarity. Uh, for instance, from 1948 to 1956, uh, there was the United National Party government, uh, which had closer links with UK as a member of the Commonwealth and the West and it had a communism, 
but had a trade very interest very interestingly had a trade pact uh, uh, rice and rubber pact with china uh, i would say that that is uh, an effect of bipolarity so from 1956 to 1977 there were four governments and uh, the declared policy was non alignment and uh, slf the sri lanka freedom party and its coalitions uh, closely followed india ussr and china then and from 1977 to 1994 there was a tilt toward the uh, towards the west basically they are jawardhana was nicknamed as yankee dicky with his uh, very close uh, ties with the usc and uh, earning india suspicion and there uh, the there was the beginning of uh, the ethnic war in that uh, decade in 80s and uh, india intervened at times violently and, and sri lanka was uh, subjugated uh, at the certain points and uh, india uh, sri lanka was uh, made to uh, uh, pressurized to uh, uh, <coughs> uh, ink indo lanka accord in 1987 and also there was uh, arms struggle in the country and there were huge uh, human rights violations etc and sri lankan foreign policy faced a lot of challenges from democratic powers uh, during this period and from 1994 to 2005 uh, there was united people's progressive alliance under mrs bandarnayake junior and uh, there was again realignment of relations with india eu and usa and uh, uh, that government got the liberation tigers of tamil elam banned in several countries and considered that as a success of uh, its foreign policy and from 2005 to 2009 now again we have the same government but under a different family clan again called rajapaksa and its policy, domestic policy was war against the ltt the tamil militants and india and usa during this time was seemingly uh, not adding much pressure on sri lanka and also the global war on terrorism uh, uh, certainly provoked the ethnic war to reach a violent end and from 2009 onwards china plays a pivotal role in sri lanka's development of uh, so we come to this infrastructure parts again in sri lanka now ports and highway infrastructure and other constructions investments on industrial zones etc uh, and sri lanka approves uh, bnr initiative and india becomes cautious uh, this time uh, usually as usual and warns etc but keeps funding rehabilitating projects and uh, uh, india continued its in- investment etc uh post uh 2009 realignment of power relations uh, rajapaksa government declared that war between the ltt and the sri lankan military ended on 19th may 2009 and military defeat of the ltt uh, surfaced or brought several other challenges for sri lanka uh, for instance development of economy infrastructure and provision of welfare and uh facing the allegations of human rights violations and charges on alleged uh, crimes during war and rehabilitation of war torn areas so they they were the major challenges locally the rajapaksa government were facing and it required a lot of international support and in the new context of changing domestic power in favor of rajapaksa led political alliance supremacy of a majoritarian single is power was a very much a likelihood In 2010, Rajapaksa was re-elected as the president for a second term with much euphoria of revival of Sinhala Buddhist nationalism. So, in the post-war period after 2009, the new major power, Sri Lanka relations, may show the following order under Rajapaksa, uh, particularly India. So, first uh, preference would be India under any government, I would say. Uh, india being the immediate neighbor and the historical and cultural or emotional relations we have lot of with india and there's a deep political economic cooperation and soft power uh, of hindi cinema music etc have a very deep uh, uh, relations with the public so with all these things india has india becomes the immediate concern in our foreign policy uh, under any government so uh, the second uh, is china so china became the leading uh, in, uh, leading uh, infrastructure developer during the the post war period and it financed a lot of economic and development projects and provided uh, 
political leverage in the international forums, developing cultural educational diplomacy, and new, and also the, uh, China became a new trend among foreign policy elite, particularly with uh, uh, particularly with the, with those who with an Asian worldview and who 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 argue that uh, the Asian century is right now uh, with us now. So then third power will be uh, USA, uh, which is the backbone of export economy of Sri Lanka, and uh, which uh, with, with uh, Sri Lanka has a lot of dip diplomatic and political influence on foreign political and economic policy challenges. And closely, uh, Sri Lanka works with uh, democ uh, closely USA works with Sri Lanka in democracy uh, and uh, its civil society elements. So. Uh, and uh, fourthly, we have EU because that is also a larger export des uh, export destination, and uh, uh, it also uh, have a lot of political influence on Sri Lanka, uh, basically in promoting democracy and uh, 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 having influence on domestic policy, etc. Domestic policy in terms of uh, on, uh, in terms of power sharing, etc. And uh, much important for Sri Lanka uh, because EU is very important when it comes to the international public opinion on Sri Lanka's ethnic issue. And uh, lastly, uh, there will be always Japan and Russia as, uh, uh, as destination of aid, uh, donations, economic and political uh, and diplomatic influence. So I would say during the post war period, the, the, the new, power, uh, new uh, major powers are India, China, US, EU, and Japan. So let's move on. And, uh, has Sri Lanka deviated from neutrality? Because uh, in Sri Lanka, from the beginning, uh, post-independent Sri Lanka declared its policy is neutrality. But today, there is very less talk about new neutrality because no power in, in the region actually talk about neutrality, no, uh, neither India nor other country. And world does not experience uh, today block politics as such, uh, as I would say. Because it happened during the Cold War, yet there is new Cold War between the West and China, as we see it now. This power rivalry is the main thing which mostly characterizes the polarity today. So power transition in favor of Asia and the relative decline of West has created an uneasy situation for small states, particularly when it, when there's a uh, again a military competition in the Indian Ocean region where Sri Lanka is a strategically important state. And uh, now we see that there is a multipolar world emerging in the world. So Sri Lanka often uh, assures other powers, particularly India, that Sri Lanka would uh, uh, never allow, would not allow uh, major powers to use its soil for military purposes. But despite all these uh, pledges, assurances, what has really happened is the following, because the, already the major powers are there, they'll settle in Sri Lanka. Huh? So this is an example. Uh, Sri Lanka signed AXA, Acquisition of Cross Services Agreement, uh, in 2007 and back in 17, and a uh, status of uh, forces agreement recently with the USA. And uh, Millennium Challenge Cooperation Agreement is being negotiated with uh, the USA right now. And secondly, Sri Lanka signed the lease agreement for Hambantota Harbor and another 15,000 acres along with it. Uh, with China for 99 years in 2017. And China currently builds an elegant financial city in Colombo in an artificial, uh, artificial land created in sea attached to Colum Fort. And thirdly, uh, when it comes to India, India has acquired much of Sri Lanka's oil tank complex in the strategic port in Trincomalee in the east. India helped to develop uh, uh, Jaffna's Palalia port. Colombo port's Easter terminal project given to both India and Japan. But the project is put on hold currently. So these agreements and infrastructure developments have well brought the major powers uh, back into the scene in Sri Lanka. So there's a lot of gambling uh, in Sri Lankan foreign policy because the, the, the government, uh, government's uh, policy is to uh, certainly balance each other. So multipolarity multi offers incentives, but the states need to carefully choose them. In an anarchical and competitive world order, survival is extremely difficult for small states. The political interests of major powers uh, are harder 
when when a small state is more vulnerable uh, economically and otherwise management of neighbors suspicion and escaping pressure and influence of extra regional powers simultaneously needs a balanced approach during the post war period 2019 2015 2015 2020 sri lanka sri lankan governments have in in a way attempted to bargain with its strategic assets, but mostly failed to make a win-win situation due to regime specific problems. And as a result, uh, as a result, survival of the state is in danger from a traditional sovereignty's point of view and dependency perspective. India, China, USA, Russia, UK, EU in post-independence period during bipolarity have worked with Sri Lanka with greater understanding and care for its independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty. But the multipolar world today has seemingly given rise to huge competition among major powers, and hence there's a threat to the eth ethical policy on their part as well. So greatest option for Sri Lanka and its small states would be to become friend of all and be neutral, but there is greater impossibility of defining neutrality in the current context as the political structure, I would mean power, does not demand for due neutrality. Because India, neither India nor other powers demand neutrality today. Because they have been, during the non-alignment period, India demanded neutrality from Sri Lanka. So neutral, neutrality as a political ethical problem. So that is my philosophical issue in this uh, research. So neorealism argues that states in anarchy attempts to survive. Yet the recent past shows well that external balancing is not something that Sri Lanka should look for. Survival attempts opens space for violence. The opening to a future makes a new life possible while exposing everything that leads to finitude and the threat of erasure. What could be the... Can I go for one minute? Yeah, you got two more minutes to go. Yeah. Right, thank you. Right. So what could be the ethics of politics of survival? Can the anarchy anarchic uh, can the archaic uh, panchil middle path non-alignment disarmament indian ocean peace on etc as constructs of the past uh, have any effect for future when all powers engage in competition for hegemony neutrality is a necessary condition for small states but also the most difficult condition when the structure does not support it yet an ethical approach to foreign relations should be the policy of the whole world and the COVID-19 is reaching us, uh, bringing us to that, uh, bringing us that lesson today right now. However, actors' commitment for such a neutral and ethical policy would be more important than relative gains sans ethics. So these are my references. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Atul uh, Lassari. This is, again, I'm not too sure whether you aware of, I'm sure you are aware that ASEAN also struggles with this, our doctrine called ASEAN neutrality. It is something that ASEAN struggles to find a balance between the two powers and we are constantly under pressure by both the powers to take sides and we keep saying that we do not want to take sides but we are constantly in this midst of pressure from both sides and this is something I think uh, for us in Malaysia and ASEAN, uh, fully understand the, the kind of uh, dynamics that you're going through in Sri Lanka as well. Let's have more conversation on this uh, during the Q&A. Thanks again. Okay, now we have our last speaker today. Um, it's Monaj Das, who is an assistant professor, Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Gauhati University of India. Uh, Monaj is gonna present to us his paper title, Interest in Water Discourse and Federal Tensions in Pakistan. Monish, the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank Monash, you, sorry. Professor Chair, yeah. uh, Chang, yes. for chairing the session and all the panel speakers for the uh, very uh, interesting presentations on different topics from uh, like uh, infrastructure projects and India-Myanmar relations and India's presence in ASEAN and all. So my uh, topic is uh, on entrusted conflicts or entrusted water conflicts in Pakistan and how it is actually uh, creating tensions for the federal relations in Pakistan. Uh, uh, I'm not having any presentation or PowerPoint slides because uh, I believe that PowerPoint presentation kills more time. So I will go an extempore presentation. Uh, uh, as it is said that the present century, it is of more of a, 
non traditional security conflicts age or century because the traditional conflicts have been uh, declined con uh, continuously and the major interested conflicts have taken a, a major forefront in the present century so likewise the case in pakistan is not an exception in that case because we see uh, pakistan has been uh, has its domestic ramifications for terror terrorism and some other issues like water related issues has its own domestic ramifications so may i will mainly focus on how the water issues is lay, creating uh, major tensions in the federal system in pa pakistan uh, we see that uh, the, there are lots of predictions from world bank and other uh, this, uh, agencies wherein uh, predictions has been made that uh, the pakistan uh, is continuously uh, the water groundwater and the the river water is continuously declining and now uh, it is believed that by 2025 from uh, pakistan has been now another situation is pakistan is considered as a water uh, stressed so, uh, country but over the years or maybe after 2025 it will uh, have the status of a water scarce uh, country because there will be water scarcity in ev in all the provinces be it seen where the major rivers originate or uh, the river passes through but ramifications can be seen in all the Uh, Pakistani provinces. So with that, uh, I'm not go into much uh, information or detail about the statistics and all. Uh, but I will uh, just try to focus on the major causes and uh, what actually has caused the uh, federal tensions related to water issues in Pakistan. Uh, the first one is uh, definitely it's a global problem that is climate change. Climate change is uh, creating. Uh, tremendous uh, havoc in terms of depleting the water resources throughout the world and you know the south asia and especially asia has been a major victim of that because uh, we are at the transition phase in the now in the in terms of development we are uh, actually sacrificing our natural resources so climate change is a major cause but it is called as a villain in for water scarcity in pakistan but the second major villain is the over centralization of central over centralization of federal government in pakistan in terms of uh, ian Tal uh, talbot's uh, terminology he has coined the term uh, punjabization of punjabization of pakistan that is the over centralization of punjab province where that is the capital city a uh, capital province uh, that controls the other provinces uh, so i will uh, discuss this uh, factor in later discussions uh, there are other factors like rising population and uh, urbanization rapid urbanization in pakistan especially in the cities like karachi islamabad then uh, dependence on uh, groundwater irrigation system uh, that is a major issue in most uh, many of the third world countries and in, especially in india also we we are dependent on the irrigation projects okay then um, this uh, water confrontations in pakistan it actually predates uh, since its inception it is the water tensions uh, can be seen uh, in the post 1947 period also there were commissions of uh, uh constituted by the british india uh, government uh, like in 1925 then in 1945 there were rao commission to resolve the water discords in pakistan but this water discord actually it became a major uh, debatable issue in the post partition or post the uh, after the creation of pakistan uh, there were uh, commissions in the post post uh, partition period also like uh, 1964 1961 commissions were there um then but the major uh, controversy is related to sharing of the indus river uh, river that pakistan after the indus water treaty of 1960 september uh, pakistan actually have uh, gained control over three rivers on the eastern side uh, these are like uh, jhelum then chenab and uh, indus whereas india got the control over rabi vias and satluj so there it but have seen provinces and other provinces they alleges that the, there is over centralization of the 
Pakistan's capital city, or that is Punjab, a Punjabization of Pakistan, there, uh, because it was uh, believed that uh, the water in Indus Water Treaty of 1970, all the provinces were not party to the uh, treaty. Only Punjab represented there in the treaty. So the Sindh believed that. Punjab also represented their own interest. They sacrificed their they sacrificed the interest of the other provinces at the cost of at their own cost by uh, forefronting their own interest. So this is the in this water treaty is a major confrontation. Though it has actually uh, resolved the in India Pakistan water inter interboundary water issues, but it has actually. Uh, created major tensions in internal politics of Pakistan because all the provinces, they don't have any consensus in terms of water sharing inside Pakistan, in terms of uh, resource sharing and all. So Sin believes that the, the major confrontation of we can see from uh, among or between uh, the Punjab province and Sindh province because Sindh province believe that the major water resources that uh, actually lies in their territory, but the majority of uh, the the maximum utilization is made in the Punjab province. So uh, we can see major tensions after the 1963, but uh, there were uh, after 1963, 1963 there uh, there were uh, other. Uh, Arrangements were made, ad hoc arrangements were made in Pakistan, but the major treaty was like arrangement was like 1991 treaty uh, that that is called that, that is for water apportionment agreement. Uh, just to uh, redress the uh, provincial uh, uh, provincial uh, grievances, like they were not part of the uh, Indus Water Treaty in 1960, so it the government tried to uh, console these provinces interest but and, and they were made part of this agreement all the four provinces were part of the agreement of 1991 that is called water apportionment agreement and they gave consent to all the provisions and clauses of the agreement but the problem lies in their implementation because uh, what whatever provisions were recorded or written down in the agreement the in letter and speed spirit pakistan has, the pakistani capital city has not followed it uh, I would like to point out uh, some uh, provisions of the agreement. Like the 1991 Water Apportionment Accord, it says that it superseded all previous water sharing arrangements and agreements which were uh, there before, before the inception of the country or after the uh, formation of the country. And uh, it protects the existing uses of canal water in each province. Then, uh, it recognizes the need for construction of new water reservoirs and uh, infrastructure for uh, on Indus River and other rivers for agricultural development. Then it recognizes the need to establish an in Indus River system authority as an implementing agency and monitoring agency for to or to look after the implementation of the accord. And it also recognizes the need for uh, need to have certain uh, amount of uh, water ditches from the barrages or the reservoirs to the downstream. But uh, we see uh, just after the uh, signing of this agreement, there was resentment from the parties, the, the provinces, because of the implementation part. Because though there were uh, clauses or provisions, but Pakistani central government has not implemented the provisions at all. and they actually carried on the same spirit of 19, uh, like 70 provisions. Uh, for example, the, the charge of uh, like the provision for uh, the need to uh, need for certain uh, minimum escape to sea, uh, escape of sea water from the reservoirs to the sea below Kotri to sec sea intrusion for which further studies are to be undertaken. Uh, what happens? Uh, there was a there is a provision under the 1991 agreement under which there, uh, the, cent the central government is mandated to release certain amount of water so that the river doesn't get dry. But what happened in the implementation stage, the, they have not released the minimum, the minimum uh, uh, this, uh, 
minimum amount of decided water uh, that was to be released by the government and as a result of this it has severely affected the coastal area coastal population like their livelihoods are at stake and the rivers near karachi they are drying up they are not like forming any delta so there are intrusions of sea water into the fresh uh, f- fresh uh, areas fresh water areas like fresh water areas are also becoming now saline water so it is drying up their uh, fresh water lakes it is uh, the sea water is making their soil saline they are less productive and uh, it is severely affecting the mons- the mangrove forest that lies in the sind uh, coastal areas so there are heavy resentments among the provinces uh, especially if we can see the maybe say the three provinces this khyber uh, khyber pakhtunkhwa province then uh, this baluchistan province and sind province they are leveling their uh, or they are portraying their allegations or uh, resentment against one gov- one province that is the punjab province so uh, these are the major resentments then uh, there are also uh, uh, the like khyber pakhtunkhwa believes that the punjab government or punjab province is still using the traditional or the 150 years old canal system that actually uh res- re- results in excessive water wastage because we need to uh, develop a modern infrastructure in uh, for uh, uh, irrigation projects and all but the punjab region it is still using the traditional irrigation projects and all so uh, there are heavy resentments from the other provinces and how to resolve these issues uh, uh how to is and these these resentments are getting represented in terms of ethnic clashes also like uh we can see uh baluchistan provinces uh resentment against or uh ethnic tensions against the central government they are trying to bargain their own uh, interest uh related to water issues also yes sir you got 2 minutes yes sir so how to resolve the issues uh, first is uh, there is a need to engage all the community uh, stakeholders like uh, ngos you have to cover then academia then research agencies we have to cover then uh, sustainable pra- agricultural practices have to be uh, taken into consideration uh, more scientific and sociological studies need to be conducted because only such the scientific studies cannot resolve all the issues there should be sociological studies also to understand the ground realities what the population or the pop- local people are having or facing from this uh, construction projects and all and uh, and there is a uh, need to sensi- uh, uh, initiate a sensitization drive through textbooks in schools and colleges because we ha- we see that uh, there is uh, over emphasis on uh, teaching or imparting uh, the idea and ideology of pakistan that is the state uh state ideology but uh we see the, the modern uh, the new te- new problems are cropping up so there is a need to modify the textbook also so that the modern gen- the new generations can be uh, given a proper education to tackle with the uh, upcoming problems thank you sir thank you so much manaj yes uh you know they, there's always this there's this saying right now that water is going to be the 21st century yes sir oil isn't it our countries will go into conflict because of water and in your case apparently it's interesting it's an intrastate tension that yes. is the reason out of this uh, difficulty um here in asean i think mekong river the uh, crisis is more of a intra uh, interstate rather than intrastate but there are parallels i think uh, between the two maybe we could uh, pick that up afterwards during our discussion Now we've got about 30 minutes for Q&A and I'm just waiting if there is any question coming through from the organizers. I if not then if we have some time then we could even have a round of questions and then perhaps have a conversation between the speakers the present presenters ourselves. So if we want to have a more dynamic conversation if we could perhaps make our questions a bit more concise and also our responses a little bit more concise so that we have a few rounds of uh, dialogue so that we could ask one another some questions 
uh, reason from our presentation. Uh, perhaps I would like just to more broadly general to the three or the four speakers here, because in some ways we, we address the ASEAN thing as well. Um, I'm interested to know, how do you guys see ASEAN? Because to Lassari has talk, uh, spoken about neutrality and then we have ASEAN neutrality. Arena speaks about ASEAN caught in the middle between the two powers. And Shabani too, in some ways, addresses the Myanmar dilemma uh, caught facing this big China power uh, in play now. Where does ASEAN stand? Is ASEAN an effective uh, bloc? Do they have the, the kind of bargaining power? Do they actually able to maintain the kind of neutrality that they the advocate, and I want to put this in the context on, of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Where do you see ASEAN uh, seeing itself? Have they responded to the overtures for this Indo-Pacific strategy? Let me start with, uh, maybe Rina would go first, and then Shrabana, and then Atul Asari, and then Monish, if you have some take on this, uh, please chip in, okay? Rina, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, yes. Professor Chang, uh, and thank you to all the speakers also. And since we haven't got questions from the chat, I think it's good that you initiated this session. Where ASEAN, the Indo Pacific, uh, in 2020, in comparison to, you know, say a year or two ago when uh, this, you know, several uh, meetings and uh, formal uh, engagements have happened. But uh, certainly, I think uh, what I have understood is that ASEAN does not want to look at any uh, structural grouping as uh, being, uh, you know, as, as being seen as containing China. So they are uh, sensitive to that fact and they don't want it to be viewed as a containment strategy of China. They want it to be an all-inclusive, uh, you know, kind of framework uh, to the extent possible. Uh, the situation uh, is changing, it's transforming very, very fast. And uh, every country is, you know, being kind of forced uh, to align with one or the other. And if you're with us, uh, then you're, you know, not with them sort of uh, kind of paradigm, which every country has to try and negotiate and navigate through. But uh, China, of course, uh, has done very well with its bilateral engagement, because even if you look at the FTA, even if you look at any kind of agreement, which they have, you know, broadly with a grouping, they always prefer to deal with uh, each country bilaterally. And that bilateral engagement, uh, you know, every country is very, very sensitive. Of. A few days ago, I had some interview with the Vietnamese also, and uh, they also said that, you know, we cannot uh, come out of that uh, Chinese grip, uh, so to say, and we cannot be seen as being anti-China. So none of the countries in the region uh, want to uh, see the Indo-Pacific as a containment strategy. Uh, you know, con to, to, to contain China. That, that's for sure. Turbana, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'll put my uh, discussion into this whole infrastructure, Myanmar and China perspective mm -hmm. when I'm talking about ASEAN. So Myanmar, uh, as we know, joined ASEAN in 1997. Uh, if we speak about ASEAN neutrality uh, and bring come to the question of do you think Myanmar is being neutral now or trying to avoid a, a tussle between especially India and China, if not Japan. Uh, there are many questions raised on this front, whether Myanmar is a playing ground for these big powers, whether Myanmar can remain neutral, is it trying to even remain neutral or is it actually encouraging these big powers to come and play in their backyard? So uh, just to come to a more scholarly discussion, we have Bertil Lintner, who is a prominent writer on Myanmar. He speaks about the fact that back in 1990s itself, it was a vassal state. It was a state which, where a senior had already happened. 
professor swaran singh also had written an article saying it it's already synthesized uh, in terms of having not just infrastructure all kinds of things i've already spoken about but today when we look at so many projects being cancelled and the fact that today we have to recognize that it is a sort of democracy that is uh, it has some sort of an agency of its own not just china is it's not a puppet anymore in the hands of china uh, that it can play through uh, so in that sense uh, is myanmar still neutral to that great power game uh, renot igrito had said that uh, it cannot china and india particularly cannot use myanmar as a field because myanmar has its own agency there are other some like mohan malik for example says that uh, uh, probably it's not really a uh, uh, you know uh, nobody can use myanmar but at the same time myanmar is itself facilitating these uh, uh, great power games it's letting countries in so that it does not uh, get into that grip of china so that literally also then converts to whether Uh, a state like myanmar can remain a uh, neutral if not asean as a whole to chinese influence or say a great power influence so i think that uh, uh, for, if we come to indonesia for example which which is such a big player in asean uh, uh, it also talked about that global uh, maritime fulcrum that we have to let uh, uh, the global maritime fulcrum was initiated by indonesia based on five pillars one was of course infrastructure connectivity uh, but the point that these initiatives keep coming in where uh, the attempt is that asean keeps moving in uh, that direction where it is not really taken over just by china so china is not the only country who is going to talk about infrastructure and bri there has to be a discussion on uh, maritime connectivity and transport connectivity that asean has to initiate uh with or without china so i think we have to look at this neutrality in terms of asean trying to uh make these discussions at multilateral forums which then countries individually are also taking up at bilateral uh forums thank you thank you atula sari you want to add something to it unmute please and we can't hear you <laughs> well uh i think uh, here what we are concerned about i mean whole it whole issue about international cooperation not the conflict dimension of it because as it states with the small or big or medium sized i think uh, we all have to survive ultimately i think that is the message that this covid has uh, given to us today so there's a big message there so when it comes to asean i think asean is a big success story when it comes to regional groupings uh, more than south asian regional organization i think asean has uh, been able to uh, i mean uh, uh, do something for their people and uh, uplift the uh, living conditions uh, uh, in that region so in that context i think asean has more to gain from the rise of uh, big powers in asia because this uh, india and china uh, i don't think there is uh, uh, the, this this uh, i don't like to sort of uh, use the realistic jargon because i am also trained in uh, uh, jnu uh, sis where all uh, my professors are uh, uh, realist uh, philosophers but uh, i would say we need to discover a humanist realist uh, language today is all about to reinvent uh, international politics because to uh, reuse the same similar language in the new context of uh, changing power i i don't think that will be good for 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 humanity per se because because after all we have one planet and we all know that now uh, ecologically environmentally we have we are facing a lot of issues now when it comes to this infrastructure development in the world uh, in uh, building uh, artificial islands everywhere and there are a lot of issues actually and uh, building and also in the armed uh, arms race arms competition there are a lot of issues and we have suffered i think uh, the 20th century has given us enough lessons if we as scholars can get together and discuss uh, philosophically 20th century has given us enough lessons enough sufferings to rethink 
uh, whether we want the same kind of realism uh, when in the in the in the new century because we know it is going to be a multipolar world and india china uh, us all are competing in this region we, we that, that's a reality so the structure is that there is a power structure in which the the the, the, the powers are competing for their hegemonic uh, places so that may be a, a natural thing because uh, in in a, in a in a in a in, in a structure uh, it can happen but but how to certainly give us ethical flavor to that because we all, all the countries all the all the states ha have to have a say voice because it's it's all um, more than i mean uh, any other century it's a democratic world in a way we, we are more towards democracy and we have a lot of uh, multilateral forums and we can negotiate anything i think i think discussion is the ultimate thing that we can have as humanity today because not the weapon so once you go to touch the weapon first and forgetting all humanity and uh, everything that we have developed throughout the century i think they are i they are, again we are going back to barbarism the tribal age so there is no need today for us to go back to the barbarism but to how to cooperate in this uh, world because now in sri lanka uh, china is developing harbors and first in sri lanka invited india to develop uh, harbors but due to some issues india did not accept that but now china has developed and uh, got the harbor on lease so there is a cooperation between china and sri lanka somehow some agreement is there but this can be looked at from different angles from for a realist for a hardcore realist for an offensive realist this would in future be used for military purposes definitely definitely it can be used definitely it can be used whether there is a harbor or not definitely sri lanka can be used for military purpose if there is a very aggressive actor so if there Thank is you. if there are aggressive actors how what is option for small state there, there are no option for small states if all the actors are aggressive so we need to rethink of the middle ground i think so thank you uh, thank you after last sir thank you um, monoch you have any do you want to yes, say sir, anything sir. on this yes go ahead just a uh, very uh, little uh, few comments from my side uh, you see that the present uh, present the scenario or the contemporary world politics is uh, it's a, a multilateralism uh, we see uh, one country is part of uh, one block then it has membership in other blocks also so i believe in multilateral world uh, the liberal and realist uh, this interest go hand in hand it co coexist together so i believe that in if if asian country asian members countries or few countries of the asean they uh, take one on one side or in one platform but they take another side on the other platform so it depends on their individual interest as well as on the the block interest as well so i think uh, neutrality we can expect in some expect but their own interest also matters like we see uh, asian has been uh, in some cases there are countries like uh, countries which are uh, pro chinese also but there are countries which are pro uh, southeast asia or south asia countries also we see a greater cooperation on the indian side like under the actis policy we are having tremendous cooperation in terms of cultural sector opening up of economic sectors like road and infrastructure and the flight services and all so we see a, a blend of both realist and liberal interest uh, in international world for politics now thank you very much thank you i just want to pick up on some points that dr uh, dr atul nasri has already mentioned and shravana uh, i just want to say that also all the other fellow speakers that this is a multi uh polar world now and we are in a global century it's kind of a democracy every country no matter how big or small you do have a vote uh to have a voice a vote at the un and shabana did say that small countries like us do have some agencies you know we are not completely subservient to these big powers yes. and shabana says that sometimes we invite the big powers we play out the two big powers to our own advantage so my our former prime minister famously said that you know i think he is just uh, raising some concern that china's rise is going to be an a, another form of colonialism but it's not the kind of outright 
for military colonialism, is it, but with the economic colonialism, that sort of brings out the image of subjugation. You know, small countries will be indebted to these big, big powers. And to some degree, small countries are inevitably we have to operate within the shadow of big powers. But this is in the 21st century, as uh, Dr. Arthur Lassiri raises that uh, we do have a certain agency. We do have rooms in which we can maneuver. Our destiny is not completely surrendered out to the superpowers. I want to bring this conversation right now. What we are concerned about in ASEAN right now, especially in South China Sea, and maybe Rina can can expound on that because you did raise it in your con uh, in your presentation about the South China Sea that we may be caught into a conflict that we do not want to be a part of. You know, we are small countries. We are always concerned that we become pawns uh, of this big power conflicts in South China Sea. How do you, how do how do you guys see the situation right now in the South China Sea and then leading up to? the November election. Is this a really dangerous time for us or are there room for optimism that sober heads or clearer heads will prevail that they will can avoid an outright conflict? Rina, go ahead. Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, what uh, we have seen of China is that uh, even the June 15th uh, incident is considered, uh, you know, as something odd. And that is why they have not even accepted that, uh, you know, formally. Uh, and they want to keep that in a state of denial. And uh, because they want to nibble away at areas without having to fire a shot. That is what my understanding is. What is the June 15th that incident? Can you, the June 15, 14th, 14th night, uh, when 20 soldiers, Indian soldiers, oh, yes, of course, yes, the confrontation because China has been on our borders, yes, uh, yes. in North and Northeast. Yes, they have been there uh, since uh, 7th of May, and this is now 17 weeks that they have been on our borders, and there is no sign of disengagement. In fact, they are also preparing for, uh, you know, the airstrikes, and that is the latest uh, information. But uh, China seeks to win uh, without firing a shot uh, as far as it can help, and that is what we have seen even for India, like, last 45 years. Uh, they did not, they do not really want to change uh, the status quo. But this time, India has shown, uh, you know, it's kind of standing up to the China challenge. And uh, that is why, uh, you know, there is this kind of increasing uh, belligerence, uh, aggressiveness, threatening. So if we have to take a leaf out of uh, the Himalayas uh, episode and uh, the experience that we are going through uh, and take it uh, to the South China Sea, mm -hmm. uh, there again, China would not really want to see even a small kind of conflict erupting. And um, I think we all recognize the interdependence between China and the United States. There is huge interdependence, you know, the more, hundred, the more than $450 billion trade, uh, you know, between the United States and China, and China with a huge trade surplus. And even if that declines, uh, both countries lose. It's not that just one country loses. So the kind of uh, interdependence that there is now uh, among countries and between countries, uh, there obviously cannot be, uh, you know, a cold war of the kind that existed earlier before 1990. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's extremely important to understand that uh, the United States in its pivot to Asia uh, wants to be seen as, uh, you know, a power, the biggest power, and it wants to, and it has been an ally of the Philippines and other countries as well, like Thailand as well. So therefore, um, it doesn't want to take its eyes off. And uh, well, China is challenging it in every uh, sphere. But uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, my hunch is that it will not want to see a full war through. And uh, therefore, it will want to continue its engagement because the economic engagement must continue for China's own growth as well. And it uh, again, you know, if you look at the ASEAN-China trade, 
the way the trade deficit among ASEAN countries is increasing with China. China is the one which is huge benefit of trade with ASEAN countries and the trade mm -hmm. deficits, uh, you know, with China for ASEAN are increasing. So therefore, uh, and China knows that it can win without firing a shot. In 2020, its four largest uh, are the four largest the world further, uh, you know, sort of solidified their position. They own 14 trillion dollars. Uh, you know, the, that that's their capital uh, assets uh, for four banks only. I'm not talking about the other banks. So. I mean, that's the kind of economic power that China has, and uh, we need to recognize it. But of course, it does understand that its military power is still, uh, you know, not uh, exactly equivalent to the United States, and it will take some time before it does become so. Yeah, Thank you, Rina. Thanks. Uh, Shabana, go ahead. Uh, so talking about, uh, you had a point about the elections and how probably we are going to uh, look at US elections and how China is going to respond. But before coming to that, I think uh, because of Shinzo Abe's resignation, we will have to also see where, who is coming in Japan now. Because the whole idea about US in uh, this part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific particularly, is uh, in a very realist sense, uh, hinged on the quad and uh, just the military part of it, obviously. Uh, so uh, who comes in uh, in Japan also, I think, will impact how China looks at US and elections and so on and so forth. Uh, having said that, if we come to the South China Sea dispute, like uh, Dr. Marwa has already mentioned or quoted uh, Professor Mehbubani's book about how a small war probably could be expected only regarding the South China Sea, where again we have to remember that uh, Philippines, Singapore, and Indonesia has sort of concluded a maritime boundary agreement in 2014. So they have made their, uh, you know, uh, legal documents ready in case there is something. Uh, so if China is to come uh, out in the South China Sea more aggressively, uh, then uh, these ultimately these are. Uh, you know, small countries or smaller countries like uh, Philippines uh, is will take a stand because it's the uh, direct impact would be with, uh, you know, Philippines, even to an extent with Japan. So we have to see what these countries are doing. And uh, maybe not very, uh, we tend to ignore these small agreements, but they will have an impact on how uh, China is going to play their game in South China Sea. Uh, that's, I think, about it, about how we are going to look at uh, generally this part of the world and U.S.'s stance in it. Um, talking about India, China, I think Dr. Marwa has already covered, and I agree with most of it. What somehow bothers me is, of course, the fact that there has been a gnawing of China on India's territory to the extent that now even Nepal does claim a part of the Lipu Lake area. So, of course, this is a concerning uh, matter for India at least and I had done some study on this dispute that's there between India and Pakistan and a part of that is now coming back to haunt us because China has come in so close to that part of the territory we also have to remember that Pakistan has already ceded a part of the Shasgam Valley to China in 1963 so of course these matter uh, does bother uh, India and how everything plays out. Uh, I mean, not in the post-COVID world per se, because I feel that uh, the world order is not, it did not suddenly change because of COVID, but it had already started changing. Of course, how COVID catalyzes some of it matters, but not so much. Uh, so that's about it on just uh, generic points that I want to Thank you, Sharbana. Dr. Samara, you want to add something to this? What is the role of the small states in the emerging new world order? So I would say if, if, if the history, I mean, future is going to be so chaotic uh, as we had have seen it in the past, uh, under if, uh, past my polar, my polar worlds, 
So are we imagining the same bipolar world that we, we, we had in the past? So that is the problem because we, we see everything through the prism of realism, actually. So now we are imagining that the same world will re, reappear uh, before us, like what we had before Second World War, First World War, etc. So uh, that is one, one, one kind of imagination, actually. So the way we imagine the world is also a part of the issue, actually. So not the amount of power, the influence that one can generate on the region, on the world. So that is another part. But also, on the other hand, the, the imagination is another issue because we all the time, if you imagine an enemy and uh, enemy attacks, and uh, so that, that's, that's part of the issue as well. So, so I want to sort of, I want to explore a new kind of realism, new language of realism, maybe Chinese realism or Indian realism. So because in Asiatic world, we also have a kind of realism which could be different from American Western realism uh, because we have not been trained to get an eye for eye. So that is a different uh, philosophy. So we have Mahatma Gandhi's, Buddhas, and, and in, in, in uh, uh, China, Confucius. So we, we are a different uh, uh, territory, different uh, people. So in that, in that context, how do we have a universal realism even when we can't have a universal democracy? So we have to seriously, I think, discuss these issues as scholars, I think. So power game will continue because these powers, whether we like or not, they will keep fighting and they will learn lessons or not. And the, ultimately, the people will suffer because in South Asia, ultimately, the, the, the suffering lot are the people. Now, with the COVID and all, our poor people are dying. Our, most of our poor people are dying every, in, in, in this region. So, but the power game is continuing. So, but as scholars and as academics, I think our uh, one, one duty that is on our shoulders is to develop a new language, new philosophy to pacify the world. Because if we also keep uh, tuning the same philosophy, which actually ultimately develops into another world war kind of situation, I think uh, there would not be we won't be able to see another world in some 20, 30 years time. So there won't be, uh, so we, we, we want to discover all the possibilities to save the world for the few possibility. So that is my uh, humble uh, opinion. Actually. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Samara. Thank you. Are we running out of time? Uh, Monoj, are you still with us? You, I, we have about a minute for you. Monoj, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Got uh, minute, yes. uh, sir, I don't have much understanding on the South China Sea issue because that is not my area of specialization. But uh, your question on the water, uh, this river construction, the dam construction uh, projects in Pakistan and how it is related to China. So I was uh, just recalling that moment uh, because recently in 2020 itself, uh, the, in Gilgit Baltistan area of that is Paki in Pakistan occupied Kashmir that already uh, some parts has been given by Pakistan to China. So mm -hmm. uh, the river project was started or it was documented in 2001, but recently Pakistan has given or uh, a partnership uh, to China in terms of 70-30 ratio. So there is heavy resentment against these uh, CPEC projects. It is part of CPEC, somehow it is related, but initially it was uh, started by uh, uh, Pakistan itself. It was not part of Chinese project, uh, but in 2020, it has been given to China uh, in terms of providing funds, like 70% fund will be given by China. Uh, so, but there are heavy resentment from uh, Gilgit Baltistan people because they believe that uh, they are actually encroaching their land on their land rights, the rights of the uh, Gilgit Baltistan people, because they believe that their interests are not taken into consideration by the central government. and. So uh, they need to uh, actually focus or they need to take uh, into board all the interest of the people, be it in the extreme uh, corner or in the center. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manoj, for bringing in this dimension, the water issue that uh, is really touched on. Uh, thank you so much. We're running out of time. Thank you, Renat. Thank you, Dr. Samara Kuhn and Dr. Uh, Shabana. You. And also Monaj, I learned a great deal from you all. 
I'm sure we will meet again in this webinar circuit by Nice, <laughs> nice sometime in the near future. All right. Thank so you. So take sir. care now, everybody, and I'll pass the floor thank back you. to Rafia now. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you for all the panelists for the interesting uh, this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Okay. And thank, thank you, you. Dr. Des, as well. Chairs, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the session, I take great honor in proposing the vote of thanks on behalf of the NICE to all who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. We would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to Dr. Peter for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions. We truly, we are truly honored to have uh, had you all with us this evening and hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Also do join at our next session. Thank you so much. <laughs>